The aim of this video is to give an overview of a few areas that are detailed in the development application DA21-0010 lodged by NCV Enterprises for the Nightcap on Minjimbal development project. That application was lodged on the 14th of January 2021 and I actually put out a video that said that the opening period was on the 15th of February for comment. The official date is actually the 17th. So from the 17th of February 2021, 28 days of public comment. The information I intend to detail a little bit in here as to give you an overview of uh, the titles, as you can see here, that are associated with it, the roads, the houses, the water bores, the heritage, the animals, the koala co corridor, the community centres, the existing structures on the titles themselves, the power and also the village. Now, these have been taken from the documents uploaded um, by the council and I've downloaded them and overlaid them and put them into position. This is the road overlay and if I actually take the overlay off this is what you end up with. All the ones in white they do not intend to touch at all. Uh, the one over here in Mandalay is actually a sealed road already. There is works that would have to be proposed to the sealed road there already. But as for that, all the rest are unsealed roads with eight patches of sealed. You can't see them very well on some, but there's one strip here, a strip here, there, one there, another one along here, one up here and there's two more one here and one here so they are accordingly sealed patches they have not specified that is inclusive though they have given details of that in the drawings but have not specified that that's actually part of the cost so that's 26 and a half kilometers of road and a large part of those roads will actually have to be widened and will clear out trees so there will be acres of trees lost just to put in the roads that are wide enough to cater for fire trucks should they need to access in case of an emergency. I'm not too happy about how they would propose in the event of a bushfire how all these people would get out safely um, but uh, that is something for another video these uh, 26 and a half kilometers of road uh, will require in a lot of circumstances actually turning into a road rather than just a track that cars can drive along with trees either side of it so some of it will need very little uh, graded unsealed road done to it. Others, they will need to forge a road in and they will need to cut the road and the trees um, through areas of where there isn't already because some of these aren't actually existing roads. They have to stick them in. So yes, if they're going to be six metres wide for the length of the road, that's a lot of metres of trees that are going. As well as the calculation, let's move on to the houses, shall we? Hang on. Now I'll just show you with the overlay before I take it off so that uh, this is how I've actually placed them all into the position that they are in. And they do look a lot bigger when you're zoomed out like this, but once you go into the ground, they're actually proportionate to the dots on the ground. It's just that they do bring out the icons when you zoom out. So um, when 
you know, as I said, when you do zoom in, you can actually see that these are the size. That's actually a bus down there. <laughs> anyway, so let's move along with there are 392 houses here. One thing I didn't mention too of the road structure, there are actually three bridges that belong to the council that they would have to look at upgrading those to cater for all the traffic that's going to go along them. Now let's back, back to the 392 houses. Of those there is about ooh, uh, 91 acres that has been cleared already so to clear an acre round each house as is required 91 of those houses won't need to do it but the rest will. So there goes 300 acres of bush. And I'd like to point out here too that my error in previous videos, these plantations are not pine plantations, they are eucalypts and the koalas love them. It is a very big koala habitat because of it. If you look at this costing that was um, part of the uh, development application upload that from the council's website you can see that they've taken into consideration 392 on-site sewer treatment plants 392 potable rainwater tanks 392 30,000 sorry was that 30,000 litre tank firefighting rainwater tank 3,000 sorry and also 392 supply and install of off-grid solar panel and back battery power battery backup system now the reason that i'm pointing this out is that initially i thought wow that's great they're actually going to have solar panels put in for them so that they don't have to do that and the sewerage treatment plant as well but you see the costing for these things has to be taken into consideration when they're putting in the application to council because there has to be sewerage, the supply of sewerage, water, roads, power, all these things that are part of pretty much the stage one that you have to cover how you are going to provide that. Now and I actually thought well that's pretty generous still to supply the solar panels but then I looked at the on-site sewer and the treatment plant and I know them as a DSTP a domestic sewerage treatment plant and I have looked into these extensively when I built my own place now with these things that uh, there's one things that is required and Talex is I dare say no different I haven't actually looked at it yet uh, the specs of it but I dare say for it to pump water out onto or grey water out onto a designated irrigation bed it needs a pump okay and a pump needs electricity now that submersible pump sits at the bottom of your tank and it needs a constant 24 7 electricity supply even if you move out you cannot turn the electricity off because it will stuff up that submersible pump submersible pumps need to be going 24 7. so that's a little thing that people might be interesting interested to take into consideration that the solar panels with the battery backup would be there to provide the electricity for that submersible pump in the Talex system so it would not be a consideration of you beaut I don't need to get solar panels now no those that solar panel designation is purely to operate the DSTP the domestic storage treatment plant unless you pick a method that does not have um, a designated irrigated bed and while we're on the subject of irrigated beds in full swing this community will have 392 house 
uh, grey water treatment plants and designated areas. And there will be at least one time in a year where it will rain that hard that it will wash out any contaminants that are actually in that designated landscape area. But any grey water that's coming out that's supposed to go onto that designated landscape area is just going to go with the rest of the flow of the water when it's pouring down with rain straight down into the water catchment. 392 houses are going to do that. Well, some may not actually go. Some are on the um, Birrell Creek water catchment side of it. But even though the others are on the Tweed River catchment side, it might not be a designated catchment area, but it's going to catch that polluted grey water runoff anyway. So all these houses here, when it rains, it's going to run straight down here into the river. With these ones up here, when it rains, it's going to run straight down into the water catchment. Now I did notice in the um, information provided that there was some way of having one designated garden area for a cluster of houses to put their grey water onto. So in other words, you know, if you're this cluster here, you're going to have pipes running everywhere to a designated bed that you all just put onto that. So you don't all have it on your own place, you've got to pump it to somewhere else. That in itself is a little bit excessive because if you're in that cluster down here, you're going to have pipe running everywhere. And these irrigation pipes are not cheap. They do sit above the ground. And in harsh climates, they will actually perish. So you will need to replace them on a regular basis. And who wants irrigation piping uh, everywhere? You know, that is just going to be disgusting. But anyway, I have not looked too deeply into the details of that yet. This is just a concern that has been noticed because of personal experience with DSTPs and how they operate. That if you're using anything that's got a designated area where it irrigates, where it pumps that irrigated grey water out onto it, you are going to need an electricity supply to keep that pump going 24-7. And the one thing that I haven't mentioned to you that is going to be uh, an ongoing cost for 392 residents is every three months you have to get a paid professional to come out and certify that everything's working okay. On the fourth visit, an annual one, that, that is a service visit where you may need to replace the, a filter they might need to pull the pump out and see if there's anything that needs looking at there. You know, but it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you three visits, just ordinary, yeah, your system's okay, and a fourth visit that's going to be a service. So you're looking on average, I mean, I wouldn't know what it would cost now, but I know that from what it used to cost me, you're looking at around four to $500 a year and that was 20 years ago, so consider the cost of that. Now on top of that, you've also got that each of these houses will need that every three months. There's 392 houses, there's 365 days in the year. So you could pretty much say that every day of the year, someone's going to be out there checking someone's DSTP to make sure it's working all right. That is more added traffic to traffic that is already going to be burden enough. So I just put on the overlay for the Beryl Creek side of the water catchment. As you can see here, a large number of the houses in the circumstance of heavy rain, which happens, well I've been told it's happened at least three times where people could not actually get over the Mandalay Bridge this year. So let's say at least three times a year you are going to have a heavy downpour where nothing that gets pushed out of those 
irrigation pipes onto the designated area is going to make it on there. It's going to all end up in the flow of all the other water. And it's going to end up in the water catchment area. All these places through here. These ones up here probably won't contribute too much to it. But over here on this side, you'll have all these houses that are then, especially these ones down here at 3222, that are just going to wash straight down into the Tweed River. And that's not a very nice thought if you're ca catching that water to drink and use that um, it's going to have contaminants that have come from... Well, those irrigated beds can quite easily have anything loosened up and washed away. And those designated irrigation beds also have to have signs on them and nobody's allowed to walk on them because there may be contaminants. It's a pity that animals didn't read signs like that. Those animals tread all over them. And that's another issue that we don't even consider is how much we could be transferring things to the animal wildlife through them treading in our grey effluent water. That if it's not safe enough for us to tread on, why is it safe for the animals to tread on? And what impacts could it have on them? Now, speaking of animals, these two highlighted areas here, the green area is actual animal corridor, wildlife corridor. The orange bit, and that orange bit there is actually overlaying green bit, so consider that's also green right now. But what the orange bit represents is the proposed corridor that they want to divert animals this way. Well, animals, specifically koalas. So to not use this corridor, but to stick up signs and say, you know, don't walk on the designated garden beds and don't uh, go this way, follow the detour, cross the busy road down here, and if you make it to the other side, yes, watch your side because there's all open paddock there. Animals are not going to like going through this narrow strip because, well, they like this one simply because it offers bush on either side. They, there is no open territory for them. Whereas down here where they intend to push them is open territory. There's vulnerabilities. And if you look at the area too, I don't think you need to be a maths genius to actually figure out that even if you just took what is on the development without this bit here, it's a lot smaller area that they propose to put the koalas over this side. And this habitat that they love so much up here, no, go away. We don't want you there. <laughs> you have to go this way now. And this is where I have the concern with this green bit of road that comes over here. If you look at that road that comes all the way down, that's the house at 3222. This is the gate at 3222. And it is going to be the main entrance point for a large part of the community because any other access is going to be more difficult. They're going to go this route here because that's a pretty steep hill over there. This isn't as steep and the access is already fairly well there for them. And a large part of these, these ones here at least, and these ones are definitely going to come in through here. So are these ones, these ones it's questionable which way they might come. It's a, a matter of preference. But either way, that's let's say a hundred houses and that's probably at least 50 cars at, at least well there's two cars per house let's just say that there's a hundred cars going along there every day so after your koala meets the detour sign that says don't tread on our dstp irrigated garden bed it then says the detour sign that you can't go up here now you've got to cross over here there's a risk 
to the koalas with all the traffic. I mean, this is one of the busiest roads and they're actually intending to make it a wildlife corridor. That's just asking for roadkill and for car accidents. So I've just added the animals or the fauna that is on the list that they've put up, which is a selected list of vulnerable species. Now there was uh, over 25, I think, from memory, on the vulnerable species of the fauna list and about seven on the flora species list. I haven't got the flora on there yet. And the flora is, um, to a large degree, too, um, hard to put on there because it's hard to represent so many trees, if you know what I mean. So essentially the overlay that they've actually produced is better than me trying to put on all those little dots and show what's going on anyway. But if you look at all the animals here, the koala corridor that needs to be relocated is the area is the koalas are everywhere and all through here for the last seven years at least there have been eyewitness reports of many koalas and I've actually got a, a few photographs taken of a koala crossing one of the roads on there uh, about in 2018 he stopped for the car but how many are going to stop for the car and how many cars are actually going to stop and look and I think the reason the koala stopped is because the car stopped I would stop too if I saw a koala or any wildlife because it's not just the koalas that you've got to worry about with roadkill you've also got to worry about the wallabies the kangaroos uh, anything that's going to run out on these roads. Uh, anyone that's travelled these roads of a night time knows especially how dangerous they can be. Now other than all these animals which have, I'll go through, there's koala, red-legged paddy melon, sooty owl, marbled frog mouth, squirrel glider, a giant barred frog, grey-headed uh, flying fox or fruit bat, glossy black cockatoo and a little lorikeet. Now some of these there's only one of them the sooty owl, the little lorikeet so there is not a large population that has been noticed but they are certainly in the area and where there's one you would assume that there is breeding grounds for them as well so again precious habitat that I noticed that they didn't put too much down in this area and yet it is the koala corridor and yet they did set up tests and everything through there you have to check that information because that seems unusually bare and so does this area over here and over here and you have to consider that the tests that have been done are limited. They're on a time frame, maybe a day or two. They put down cameras that may take photographs, you know, of anything that passes through. Certainly everything that's marked on here is not everything that they noted is on the property. Uh, dingoes, so you'd have your dingo packs. And monitor lizards, those big boys. <laughs> You're going to have them there too. Uh, bush turkeys, uh, rats, yeah, snakes, abundance of typical wildlife that you'd expect to find in there. You can see all the frogs in there. <laughs> that is sort of like a wet area through there. There's a lot of, um, well, I haven't looked yet, but I'm, I'm assuming it's more a wet sclerophyll forest than anything else. Uh, the other ones are more would be more towards alpine simply because of the altitude of them. And uh, that's another thing that you've got to consider too with your solar panels is that the altitude of most of them, if you recall Richard Moat going to the lookout, he actually talked about that uh, the Aboriginal name once translated uh, means cloud catcher. And 
there is, once you get to a certain altitude, a fairly likelihood that you are not going to be able to use your solar paneling very effectively because you're going to get more cloud cover. And most of these places, from what I've looked at, may actually get high enough to get a larger amount of cloud rather than the lesser amount of cloud. So that's something to consider for the effectiveness of any solar paneling you may put in on top of the solar, solar paneling that is there to run the DSTP. And then on top of that, you're probably going to need to look at, well, either a solar panel battery backup or a generator. And in which case you're using a generator, which a lot of people do prefer uh, because they're quick and easy if you need to and you can always go down and get get some diesel to, to run them. So ultimately if your battery backup for your solar panel is running on low, you can't go to the shop and get some power to pump into that. So um, yes, there are limitations on the solar panels and you should be aware too that one of those limitations may actually be the altitude because you can't see it uh, on my screen at the moment, but the altitude on average is anywhere from 180 to 220 metres above sea level. And you're going to be looking at cloud, uh, yeah, probably at at least your 180, 190 mark. Anyway, next subject. So these little blue dot, dots are where they conducted bore tests, water bore tests, down to see um, accessibility to the artesian basin. Now again, considering the altitude, you've got to go down to sea level and then down 32 metres to tap into the artesian basin. And they charge per metre to go down to sea level and, well, down to the artesian basin to tap in. And that would more than likely be on the CAP program because every one of those bores where there's a hole in the ground, it, re it lowers the actual pressure in the artesian basin. And that's been an ongoing problem that has been, um, it has actually changed a lot that the pressure has got a lot better since they've capped the water bores. The next slot of images is actually the heritage appendix where it has marked the locations of the a a AHMS, which I don't know what the M stands for yet, I haven't looked at, but I Aboriginal Heritage Something Site. So it's a registered site that they've gone looking for, and in some circumstances they have not found that site, and that has been marked by yellow. The ones marked by blue indicate an artifact scatter and the one marked in pink are artifacts and the red one over here is the keeping burial. Now I'm actually a little surprised at how this is actually encroaching. Um, Mark McMurtry said none of these areas would be involved with the housing. Now most of these housing, if you check the road frontage, they are narrow road frontage and deeper blocks that they would have exclusive use of. These areas here are very close in these exclusive use areas that would be allocated to these. So I don't see how in many of these circumstances how they can claim to have taken into consideration all these things and kept people away from them. Again, these ones are going, the blocks are coming back and it's not protecting all of the sites. There is most definitely an overlap where it is not actually protecting all the sites, especially the keeping burial. It's the only one marked. But regardless, this is their claim. Okay, so the next thing are the community centres. There's five of those. 
and only four of those are actually appearing to actually be already on cleared land so four of those would need an acre clearing around them as per fire requirements as well so everything that they're doing is going to be taking away acres hundreds and hundreds of acres at least 300 acres for the housing and probably well uh, so many uh, meters at least 50,000 meters of trees to remove to make them six meters wide enough for the fire trucks to come through and they're also intending to push all of the koalas out of their favorite habitat over to this area over here that they won't like it's too open and especially with all of this on this side that would be they would feel very uncomfortable they would feel blocked in so no I don't think that they're going to cooperate and follow the detour signs so just finishing up here this next uh, set of symbols that you see here all of these little round ones are actually power poles and these little stars are either underground boxes or um, I forget the name now but they represent sort of like a main so somewhere that's earthed out and there's a, a supply going there and I've only done it for uh, the NICAP on Minjimble development I didn't do it for uh, over here at the Mebane Springs there's 32 of those little stars over there <laughs> 32 compared to 392 that they want up through here you know it's just a, well okay so as you can see that there is power poles already running all the way in this is sawmill number two here it's running all the way into there and across here is where they do their cropping for their hemp farm and that is called Central Hill so for the few people that are actually you know lucky enough to be along where the power poles go or close enough where you might be able to just easily run and connect into the main power supply yourself you won't have to worry so much about your solar panels and everything else just like everybody else your electricity bill See, no matter what you do, you're always going to have bills and it's always going to cost money in one way, shape or form. And one thing to consider is two out of 392 houses, how much uh, is rates going to be each year and how much are you going to have to pay each year to council as your contribution for rates? Just something to consider anyway all those little squares actually represent appendix G1 and the locations of all the buildings that were identified when the ground was surveyed look at this pile of rubbish here just up the road from 3222 these images are a couple of years old so you have to consider too this one here at pump 1 also consider that the caretaker advised recently flooding wash tops all the way that was a couple of years ago so corrugated iron ended up into the river that's wonderful isn't it but the caretaker didn't take much care and repair any of that because this pump is now actually in a tree it was flooded into a tree in January I think this year so not taking very good care the caretaker isn't taking very good care of things pile of rubbish up here that's a couple of years old I'd hate to think what it is actually looking like now so this is just a survey of how I've put in all this information and I will go through a lot of this information separately in other videos as I go into more detail 
about what's in the development application and how this very complicated subject appears that, um, well, I won't go into it here, but it has to do with the village over here and Peter Van Leischelt's previous concept. Hang on a minute. Right, this area marked in blue here is pretty much a copy of how they translate across that this is the village area. And this is based on the same area, supposedly, that the previous LAPS DA of DA06-1054 that Peter Van Leishout put in. Uh, this is supposed to be that. But I want to show something. Now there are three different versions of where I can stick things depending on the images that I'm using but I do not actually believe that they are in scale. So these things here might actually represent up around here. But essentially if you look at even there where the road network ends there and not even take into consideration any of those roads, these roads here that are part of what they say is the village concept don't exist in stage one road infrastructure. The only road part that actually exists is this road coming down through here and this one, where is it, coming up through here. So they are the only roads that are planned as stage one development. So if the village concept that's also gone and been put forward f with it, where is the updated village concept that will be built on the road infrastructure that is created in stage one? I'm not seeing that come across from the images provided at the council. Uh, with, well, with what the council have been given, there are all these other roads that are not accounted for. And some of these actually include going over bridges that they intend to put bridges in. As I said, I think it's a little bit out of scale because this dam here is meant to be up here. But if I dragged it too much up, the road wouldn't fit in here and this wouldn't fit in over here. So that's why I believe it's actually not to scale. But everything else has been placed in position along with the river that's in the right location. The river's in the lo right location there as it is around here. So whether you know, it can be stretched up further that way. It just moves everything out of position here. So accepting that this area here could be this up here. But it still does not account for all these other roads that are part of what is the concept of the village. And on that note, I'm going to leave that query to be delved into a little bit deeper in other videos. At this stage, I'm just going to leave off. I think I've covered all the subjects that uh, I had. Just one moment. Yes, I think that about covers everything that I wanted to talk about in this video anyway. And just to remind people that it is from the 17th of February 2021 with 28 days for public comment. And when you do leave a public comment, except that it will go on public display and everybody will know what you've said. So be sure not to say anything that you wouldn't want other people to say or that you couldn't be held accountable for because, oops, you didn't think it was going to be said in public. Yes, it is. It's actually called public comment for a reason. <laughs> All right. And on that note, I'll catch you on the next. Take it easy. Bye.